Uh, greetings, comrades. A quarter of a century ago, in the summer of 1995, Momir was facing an execution date. The date was scheduled. We had one mission, the movement, stop the execution. And somehow, through mass mobilization, through a lot of unity, a lot of coordination, we helped stop that execution. On the move. Assalamu alaikum. Free Momia. Free Momia. Free Momia. Free Momia now. Brothers and sisters, comrades, it's certainly my pleasure to be here. One of your state representatives from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I am ashamed to be a state representative in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania with a chump like Governor Ridge at the helm. I'm ashamed. But I wanted to come here today to let you know that some of us are not afraid. That even though we may be elected, we'll say what's on our mind. But we must understand that we are freedom fighters first. And that all the other things come next. Then I'm a black man first, and then a state representative. I don't confuse the two. Let's want to set an example with Maria. Let's want to lynch his brother, because he has the nerve to stand up and articulate the oppression that poor blacks in Philadelphia have been experiencing. And like many in recent history who this system has put to death, they're trying to do the same thing to him. I think it's time for us to wake up and realize and understand that you got a lot of us that are willing to go to battle because the freedom ain't gonna never be free unless we take it. There's too many of us sitting around thinking that it's gonna come to us on some damn silver platter. Wake up, you fools, and understand this man has no respect for you, none, none whatsoever. And they will continue to do what they do to move you only because they feel that you don't have no heart. My name is Leslie Feinberg. with the family of Patrick Dorisman and all the victims of police brutality from here today. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans people are no strangers to police and right-wing violence. When Matthew Shepard was murdered, we marched here in the streets 10,000 strong. And we made clear that we were no less outraged over the racist lynching of James Byrd Jr. in Jasper, Texas. Our march was viciously attacked. We were beaten and arrested by the same NYPD that lynched brothers Doris Mung and Amadou Diallo. An injury to one is an injury to all. That's why we fight to free the world. Mumia stands with rainbow flags. Mumia from death row called for unity to stop anti-gay murders. It took courage for him to stand up against gay action. Well, let me just say this to y'all. I want to send a message to the FOP. 
I want to make it loud and clear so it won't be any mistake about what's being said today. And I'm saying it as a black man in the city of Philadelphia and not as the state representative. I ain't scared the hell of y'all. And I'm not going to let you intimidate our people either. That's over. So when you come on with some threat about you going to boycott every event that we have and you want to stop the people from coming to contribute their money, get the hell out of our way because we ain't going nowhere. The time has come for everybody to wake up and realize that this ain't no joke. We're not going to let you take Mumia's life. And we want to send a message to America that the death penalty has got to end. We're going to wipe it out the same way they did in South Africa. But they did it by power of the people. When Nelson Mandela stepped out of jail and threw his hands up in the air, he was a strong brother. After 27 years being in jail, it didn't cripple his spirit. And I want to let all of you know that come from all across this country, you got some brothers and sisters in Philadelphia that are willing to rumble no matter what and ain't afraid of the Philadelphia police, the national police, the FOP, and all the rest of them that come together with it. Right after we beat that uh, death warrant back with a stay of execution, Governor Ridge went on record stating very clearly that when the Supreme Court, he didn't say if the Supreme Court, he said when the Supreme Court turns Mimia's bid down for a new trial, he would immediately sign the death warrant. Right after that, State Senator Dole, State Representative Michael McKeon also stated very clearly that they were going to introduce legislation to make sure that Mumia did not, you know, escape the death hole of this government. What they introduced through President Clinton, the Effective Death Penalty Act states very clearly that in order to get a federal habeas corpus, a federal habeas corpus is granted to people relief when a person is so that the government has not given them a fair trial. After hearing all of our witnesses in 1995, Judge Sabo said he disbelieved all of them and he believed all the police. And so he wrote 130 findings of fact in which he ruled for the prosecution 130 times and zero for Mumia. Five of them, according to their own count, five of the seven justices acknowledged in an opinion that they are justices who were endorsed by the Paternal Order of the Police, which publicly seeks Mumia's execution. There's not the one way to stop this murder. And it's not for us to continue to put petitions in where nobody can see except the government. We must show this government in mass numbers. And I'll be making it very clear that on April 24th, we're planning to bring millions of people into Philadelphia. For three decades, Abu Jamal argued that racism on the part of the trial judge and prosecutors led to his conviction. Two years ago, the third U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals agreed with a lower judge who set aside Abu Jamal's death sentence after finding jurors were given confusing instructions that encouraged them to choose death rather than a life sentence. The U.S. Supreme Court then ordered the court to re-examine the decision. In April, that ruling was upheld and prosecutors had to determine whether Abu Jamal would get a new sentencing hearing in court before a new jury. Well, on Wednesday, Philadelphia prosecutors announced they will no longer pursue the death penalty against Mumia Abu-Jamal. We did it. Since then, as many of you know, it's been a long quarter of a century, 26 years. We have waged a bold, never-ending sometimes frustrating and disheartening struggle to free Comrade Mumia, a political prisoner in jail and almost killed for fighting for the freedom of the black nation. Now 
we face a similar situation in my view as the one we faced in 1995 when there was an execution date for Mumia on the calendar. We have to get Mumia out of prison, comrades, and it must be now. There can be no hesitations, there can be no waiting. His health is such that Mumia's birthday about a month ago from this weekend will probably be his last if we do not free him. That says it all. That explains the critical moment that we are in. Mumia must not be left to die in a dungeon. It's what the police want. It's what the FOP wants. It's what the oppressor wants. They wanted to execute him. They didn't get that. So they stole his life. 40 years. Now we must deny them the final victory of watching Mumia die in the dungeon. Now, comrades, we have to do whatever is necessary, as Malcolm said, by any means necessary, to wake up the movement. A lot of good people, a lot of good leaders have come to Mumia's support over the years, but they're busy. They may not know about Mumia's health. In this era of social media, we were bombarded with information. So we have to somehow blow away all that information that many of the forces around the world are bombarded with to make it clear to them that right now we face another life and death moment. Especially we must wake up the black movement. And, and I'm talking about all of the wings of the black movement. The militant black liberation fighters of every generation from Black Life Matters to those of us who are the veterans of the struggles of many decades ago when we had the Black Panthers and all of the other forces that led us to where we are now, as well as the ministers, the civil rights forces, the leaders, many of whom are still alive. We've got to get them on board and make them realize that we've all got to realize that this is the time to act. We are running out of time, comrades. And, and the question is why? Why the vitriol against uh, Mumia? And it's because everything Mumia represents, his political analysis, his attention to root causes of social problems, his commitment to solidarity. Mumia writes about domestic problems as much as he writes about international problems. And he has a critique of the state and of capitalism. This means that he represents a continuity uh, in the black radical tradition, a continuity in black radical descent from the 1960s uh, to the present, to the present. And, and his voice is essentially dangerous. So in the late 19th century, uh, labor activists who were identified as part of the Haymarket affair, were rounded up by the police, accused of crimes they did not commit, and sentenced to death. In the early 20th century, Sacco and Vanzetti, two anarchists, uh, were executed by the state. In the 1950s, the Rosenbergs um, were executed by the state's uh, communists, and in the post-civil rights movement era, Mumia became uh, the figure that the state wanted to make an example of, to send the message to those who dare resist authority, resist the state, resist capitalism, resist empire, that this is what will happen to you. Starting immediately, we've got to come up with a strategy 
that brings all of these forces, not just in Philadelphia, but all around the country and all about the world together with a conviction and a dedication to free Mumia. If we cannot free Mumia now, when his life is at risk behind those bars. Uh, I just got a call from Bob Boyle, uh, one of Mumia's, uh, oh my God, one of Mumia's um, attorneys. Uh, Mumia has COVID. Um, she's in the infirmary. Um, their attorneys called our attorneys. He had gotten a rapid test. And, uh, and they did a, conducted another test and uh, it, it came out positive. So Mumia Abu Jamal has COVID-19. The chances of him dying in prison are a hundred times greater than if we can free him. And he may have an opportunity to have a little bit of what's left of his natural life. We were in jail for 41 years. We went in those prisons healthy and they systematically killed my sister Merle in 1995, my husband Phil in 2005, and my brother Delbert. He came home but they had already did so much damage to him in prison through medical neglect, just like they do on Mumia, that he was only out here a few months where the doctor said his condition was such that had he got proper treatment, he could have had years to live. Years, they were appalled at the condition that Dover was in, appalled at the mistreatment that he suffered in them prisons. And we're telling you this because we want y'all to know that we're not exaggerating about Mumia. Johanna mentioned that Mumia worked for the National Public Radio, NPR, in Philadelphia. The day we were doing the protests outside of DA Larry Creston's office, several of the local organizers, uh, Johanna Noel, Pam Africa, received calls from a, con for, from a consultant for National Public Radio asking them for input on Mumia's history. Right, but one thing for sure, Krasner, NPR has commissioned WHYY reporter to do an obituary for Mumia. Think about that. Think about that, comments. You know, that the state, the state is already looking at, you know, writing the obituary for our comment. It, it is something so incredibly infuriating about knowing that you know, even while it's common practice for news outlets to to prepare obituaries ahead of time, to be doing this when you know when Mumia is experiencing this health crisis, and particularly given that Mumia himself was a correspondent for WHYY and worked for NPR, and Mumia was you know one of the most important journalists in Philadelphia. But well, one of the things, I mean, we did what any good journalist should do, exactly. which is that he listened. One of the things that yeah. turned Mumia around, too, and that made him understand there was something happening with Mumia. My sister Janine Africa's three-week-old baby was mm -hmm. trampled to death by Philadelphia police. And Mumia came not just to cover you know, a tragedy like that. But he took time and sat there and let Janine, you know, talk at her own pace and very patient and all of that. And see, this is close to our heart, not only because Mumia stood up for move when nobody else would. He was the only journalist in the 70s that would print the truth, no matter what they said. He was the president of the Black Journalist Association. He had his own show on WNPR. He had his own column in the Tribune. He would not stop, he would not lie. His bosses told him to lie, to stop writing about the move situation. And he said, that's my job. You know, Mumia 
throughout the years have been correcting people and all through examples and the story of move and all he made people more sensitive and that made Mumia a target and all because this government did not want people to understand who Move is, move is who and who John African right, is. and who John African is. This is the founder is. of Move. Yes. yes. A lifestyle that defies the laws of our society. A psychotic group of revolutionaries that I know of and dealt with myself, uh, but only in a civilized community, only in a democracy that they get away with what they get away with. If they were in the countries that they represent, like some of the others that were here, the Stokely Carmichael's, the Cleavers, that all ran to Cuba, Red China, Africa, you name it. And that's what's wrong with this country. We're backing off too much. And you accept that face value absolute lies that are told to you. You don't even get off your asses and walk down to, to look where these people claim they were. So one of you people ought to start examining your consciences. What do you do when you print it? You put it out. It's not reviewed by trained lawyers. It's not taken by trained investigators. And you put it out as people who unfortunately had confidence in the media. They're learning though not to have. They believe what you read, what you write, what you say, and it's got to stop. And one day, and I hope it's in my career, that you're going to have to be held responsible and accountable for what you do. Mayor, I think the omission of what the charges are, please. Exactly what the charges are against the movement. All 12 are charged with one count of murder, conspiracy, weapons violations, and eight counts involving the other eight officers and fire and the commission of that one to you. Eight counts of aggravated assault. They slowly took everything from him. They took his show on NPR. They took his position at the Tribune. They dropped him from the Black Journalists Association. Mumia was relegated to driving a taxi. Um, and and th there's, there's an added insult to that. It's a very exciting thing that the WHYY workers are unionizing. It sure would be interesting if the WHYY union took a stand to support Mumia. Absolutely. Given Mumia's long history with NPR and the most recent incident, uh, shouldn't folks take action outside of WHYY at 150 North 6th Street? Absolutely. Uh, that's exactly the kind of creativity that we need. In fact, you should know that in Paris, in the 1990s, students occupied the offices of Le Monde <laughs> the uh, major newspaper in um, in Paris, so that they would address the issue of Mumia and cover it. The attempt has been made to diminish the relevance of Abu Jamal as a journalist in 1981. But this man who was elected president of the Philadelphia chapter of the National Association of Black Journalists was already well known throughout the city as a fiercely independent up and coming journalist. In fact, by the age of 15, the FBI was tracking the young writer for the Black Panther Party through their draconian and illegal program known as COINTELPRO. Not for violent behavior, but because of his, quote, inclination to appear and speak at public gatherings. And then they came right out and they shot him in the streets. And you know when they shot him, it was two days after Mumia called into a radio program where the judge that sentenced us to 32 100 years was on the radio, Judge Malman. Mumia called in and asked the judge who killed James Ramp that they had us in jail for. And he pushed and pushed. The judge tried to evade the, the question and Mumia wouldn't stop. Finally, the judge just said, I don't know who killed the cop, but they said they're a family and I sentenced them as a family. Three days later, our family called, we called home and our family said Mumia has been shot in the streets, in the hospital, close to death, and they're charging him with murder. Uh, I've been active in this movement since the 1990s. So in my, as I was flourishing politically um, in graduate school and college, Mumia was the Che Guevara of our time. And there was a massive movement of tens of thousands of people marching domestically and internationally, if you were a person of conscience, 
you were out in the streets to defend Mumia's life. All across the country, folks know varying details. So the public is all over the place. They don't really know what's, what transpired recently. So what we can confirm is a judge reinstated Mr. Abu Jamal's appeal rights in December of 2018. And then in January, your office appealed the judge's ruling that Mr. Abu Jamal should be allowed to re-argue his appeal before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. So my question to you, and this is from this the general public, because when people um, ask me about the case, and I am not an activist in this case, so I just you know, I, I basically know just a little bit more than what the general public knows. A lot of people are confused about the fact that someone has to appeal to have their appeal rights restored. As we have made clear in filings, if people bother to read our filings, it's always good to read our filings. As we have made clear in our filings, it's an issue if you say that any case that Ron Castile heard including ones where all litigation was done before he was the DA, have to be reconsidered. That's a real issue. The case law says that the object of getting a jury uh, is to get, and I wrote it down, I looked in the cases because I had to look this up because I didn't know this was the purpose of a jury. Uh, for a jury is to get a competent, fair, and impartial jury. Well, that's ridiculous. Uh, you're not trying to get that. Like I said, you have to go in there with the idea that you want jurors who are going to be most suited to convicting this defendant. Okay? Now, what does that mean? You're there to win. And, uh, and in order to win, and the defense is there to win too, and the only way you're going to do your best is to get jurors that are as unfair and more likely to convict than anybody else in that room. I've had fairly good success with these rules, and I think if you stay to them, you'll have fairly good success too. And that is, uh, and, uh, uh, Let's face it again, uh, there's the blacks from the uh, uh, low income areas are less likely to convict. Uh, it's just, it, it, I understand it. It's an understandable proposition. There's a resentment for law enforcement, there's a resentment for authority, and as a result, you don't want those people on your jury. Uh, and it may appear as if you're being racist or whatnot, but again, you're just being realistic. You're just trying to win the case. And so you'll end up getting four and five black women on your jury thinking they're going to be uh, helpful to you because you got a black doesn't work. It just doesn't work. I don't think it works. Uh, I think your your goal is the same regardless of what kind of case you have. You want a jury that is uh, cohesive, dynamically, and that is attuned and is conviction prone. That's what you want. You want a jury that is that you feel is conservative, stable, and can, and is more likely to convict. Uh, that's been my experience. I, I don't know how many juries have gotten hung up, and sometimes you have to take them. I mean, you're down to no strikes, and the guy comes in, and he's otherwise okay, so you got to take them. But they, they, they hang you up. I mean, I've seen juries out and out and out. And then, then, besides all that, they get all hung up on the law. Then they start wanting, they wanted to be, you know, Oliver Wendell Holmes now. Well, I'm a, they have a higher standard. They hold you up to a higher standard. They hold the courts up to a higher standard because they're intelligent people. <coughs> they take those words reasonable doubt, and they actually try to think about them. And you don't want those people. You don't want people that are going to think it out, and they're going to think about your case, and they're going to think, well, maybe the angle was this way, and maybe she didn't see it like that, and they're going to analyze it. You want people to come in there and say, yep, she said he did it, he did it, and that's what you want. Uh, I wish that you could ask everyone's IQ. If you could know, know their IQ, you could pick a great jury all the time. I've always felt that, you, that, that a jury of like eight whites and four blacks is a, is a great jury, or nine and three. It's an issue if you say that any case that Ron Castile heard, including ones where all litigation was done before he was the DA, have to be reconsidered. That's a real issue. Um, the reason why Mumia is so famous is because he was the only political prisoner facing execution, right? Of all of the black political prisoners, he was the one facing execution. And the black political prisoners themselves suggested that everyone focus on Mumia in order to save him. Um, you know, every single case is serious, but that means those potentially thousands of other cases where there may have been 
strong or weak verdicts are a serious issue too. So the filings say what they say. The filings suggest the issue or issues that we have with the decision that was made by that judge. We have not written our brief yet because the deadline has not arrived. And we will read that brief and I will hope people who saw that we went and found boxes that hadn't been disclosed and that we turned over those boxes. I would hope that those people would not boil this down to some kind of simplistic comic book about what is really going on. Um, and so when you filed whatever that, whatever you did to in a, opposition to the appeal, is that considered prosecutorial discretion? <laughs> you know, we make decisions in every case and we try to get the facts and the law correct. And we have to not only look at the individual case, but we have to look at its effects on every other case. Look at its effects on every other case. We take that case uh, no more and no less seriously than every other case because of the notoriety about it. One of the things that I've certain, certainly seen in our work around exoneration and conviction integrity is I have seen that often the unfamous people get a whole lot less attention than the famous people. So when Krasner says that Mumia is famous and a dilettante, that's essentially what he's saying. Oh, Mumia is this dilettante who gets all of this attention. Um, I think we need to call him out because he, in fact, uh, said this in one of his early interviews with The Intercept. He said that, that he doesn't want to talk about Mumia because there are plenty of other uh, young people from the projects that need attention. And when I read that, and I'm going to, when I, I just need to say this, and I want to say this everywhere I go. That statement reeks of liberal paternalism. Because if the kid from the ghetto gains a voice and a platform and becomes a, a luminary, as Mumia is, then you want to silence him. You want the kid from the ghetto in his place and you want to save that kid. You don't want that kid to speak for himself or herself. And that's what Krasner's telling us. I don't want to hear from Omea because he's got a voice because he's not going to sit down or lay down and die before the um, white supremacy that lives today um, in Philadelphia and across the country. Of course, there are some things that I don't know the answer to. I don't know why certain things happen, but I have some insights and impressions why they do. In Moomi, Moomi's founder, John Africa, teaches that when you're committed to doing that which is right, the power of righteousness will never be treasured. That is your standard by which you do all that you do. You say, is it right? And if it's right, you go forward, no matter what the opposition, no matter what walls stand before you. That has been my personal motivating force. Um, I think that some young people are um, touched by the revelation that when I was their age, when I was 14, 15, 16, I was involved in a movement that they now know no longer exists. And I know that not just based on what I read or what I felt or what others have reported to me. I know that intimately, personally, because I've met young guys coming to death row. And I mean, about as apolitical as a lemon come up to me and say, ah, uh, you know what, hey, uh, hey, oh, hey. I'm like, man, who are they talking to? Yeah, hey, Grandpa, uh, my mother, my grandmama told me about Black Panther. You know, what's up with that? You know, and I've met people whose parents were in the Black Panther Party, and they tried to talk to their children when they were out on the street, but they didn't listen. Now they come here, they're on death row, and they're finding out about it. And I give them a book or talk to them, or, you know what I mean? send them some information. And I think that that same thing happened because 
right now, not just in Africa, America, but in America, period, the young people in America are in an extreme state of alienation. They are, for all intents and purposes, the enemy of the state. They don't see any future for them other than working for McDonald's, flipping burgers, you know, uh, you know, working at the video store. I mean, come on. There is no, there is no promise for them. Unlike even our generation when we were kids, where they were, for all intents and purposes, endless promises. I know what you mean. Even unfulfilled, but endless promises. I mean, I remember when I was a young man, you know, well, I got fired from quite a few jobs for running my mouth and talking about stuff that I wasn't supposed to talk about, but I never had a problem getting a job. Well, a young man my age, that was uh, my age now, would have a problem with that first job. It's a, the economy has been transformed. So in the face of that alienation, you see, they look back and they see the history of a party like the Black Panther Party. And they're attracted to that militant standard and example because they don't see it presently. They can see X Panthers, some of them. They can't see Geronimo because he's been in that hellhole in California for so many years. They can't see Dr. Mutu Shakur because he's been in that hellhole in California for so many years. But more importantly, they don't see that continuing reality. And they do not hear a voice that speaks truth to power, that talks about their oppressed, repressed, dogged reality. And I try to do that in some ways. And I think that because they hear from this old man someone who speaks the truth about what they're looking at, they hear, they respond, and they come. Yeah, it's out fucking outrageous. Mumia was in the, a, a ghetto kid. He was, he grew up in the projects. But he joined the Black Panther Party and he gained a revolutionary consciousness. And then be, he became a public enemy of the state. And how do you view the role of prisons in society today? Well, Remember back during when we were young, and we was back during the Vietnam War, we used to talk about the military industrial complex. Well, now you have the prison industrial complex. And you have what um, is the ultimate um, solution to America's economic problem. Those who are poor, those who are powerless, those who have no access to the wealth that one needs to survive, and I, you know, perhaps wealth isn't, but the resources one needs to survive. Uh, in an area where um, there is corporate downsizing and there are no jobs and there is only a service economy and education is being cut, which is the only rung by which people can climb. Um, the only growth industry in this part of Pennsylvania, in the eastern United States, in the southern United States, in the western United States, is quote unquote corrections, for want of a better word. The corrections industry is booming. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, this, this joint here ain't five years old. Some corporations made a mint off of this thing. This thing called millions of dollars, millions of dollars to be built and constructed. But second to that, you have across the United States for the first time in modern history, you have small rural counties and districts begging the government, build a prison here, please. There was a time when it was, uh-uh, not in my backyard. You better not. I don't want that here. But now they're talking about, oh, jobs. <laughs> you know, and you know, this, that's the, that's the reality. That's the reality that we're working with. And of course, blacks, Latinos, Hispanics, Mexicans in the West and Puerto Ricans in the East and uh, so-called white trash, poor whites, are the raw material 
Yeah. We're like the hamburgers and McDonald's. We're the raw material. Yeah. We're being fed into this. And uh, what you see in Congress and what you see in state houses are the greasing of the conveyor belt on that, you know, that meat patty line. Because there are no laws anymore. Think about it. You know, when you look at the trend of the law, and I mean, analyze the cases, read the cases and see what they're saying. You don't hear anybody talking about, you know, uh, search and seizure, you know, Fourth Amendment or any other amendment. What you hear in popular discourse on talk radio stations or in the newspaper is lock them up, lock them up yesterday or kill them. You see, and it, it becomes a political, again, an engine feeding an industry, the prison industrial complex, you see. And it is so naked now, so negative now, that as Monica said, you can have over 1.1 million people in this prison, in these prisons. And you have people saying, well, they need to lock up more people. I mean, you have people actually saying that. Of course, they don't know what they're talking about but they're just following a script that has been laid down to them you know, by the media, by the politicians. Um, the reason why Mumia touches me in a different way because my father has been locked up my whole yes. life. I remember and, us talking about that when we first met. Yeah, and that's, that's something that resonates with me the most is the fact mm -hmm. that, you know, I grew up without a father and um, I can't, and he, he lost, he's lost to mass incarceration. Um, the way I remember my childhood is going to different prisons, Rikers Island, some of the worst prisons you can think of as a kid, I'm going to, I'm walking through all, all these gates. Just, I just remember seeing barbed wires and gates just to see my dad for, you know, a couple of hours, but this criminal system and the system itself, the way it's designed, when they come out, even as convicts, you know, ex-cons, they don't set them up for success. They set exactly. them up. They set them up to go right back into that system. Exactly. He literally got a job and he tried to do the right thing. And then he got laid off because after the background check comes off, oh, this guy, he's not going to change his life. Right. And the people around him, they're still out there doing the same thing. And he couldn't get away from that. He couldn't escape that. And unfortunately now, um, you know, I won't see him until once again, he's 65. And he's going through the same thing. He's going through the same thing as Mumia. And I just feel it. I feel all of that. Pennsylvania politicians springboarded their entire careers trying to kill my people. They like to appease, they like to empower the races in the state, right? You know, but not, not with the blood of my people, not my pop pop, right? Um, you know, personally, I'm like very worried. I've been like a little anxious. Um, you know, we know what they'll do to continue to silence people who inspire people. Uh, we need to stay on them. We need to stay ringing those phones. We need to let them know that we watch it. Right. We need to hold him accountable because he's behind enemy lines right now. Right. This is right before his birthday. You know, he talked to my pop on Friday a couple of days after, um, you know, he, he was he was laughing and, and counseling my dad on a life milestone, you know, poking fun at him. You know, the things that like a father does with a son, um, like my grandpa is like a man full of love. Right. And wit and humor, you know, and he's amazing. Right. Um, I couldn't even schedule a video chat with my grandpa, a video call, right? And I called my pop and he was as confused as I was because he had just talked to him, right? A couple of days before, right? And, but little did I know that he was being smuggled secretly. You know, we didn't even know where he was. My grandfather, Mumia Abu Jamal is in the hospital, right? And he's been fighting, right? Um, just, you know, Mumia is an innocent man, you know, factually and legally, right? They know it, we know it, the world knows it. You know, we must not let up. Uh, we have to keep going. They'll keep trying to divide us, you know, and like uh, weaken our resolve, but they can't, right? The truth shines through all darkness.
we're witnessing the continuation of a black resistance movement that came before us. We got to keep on our A game. We'll keep our voices high, make sure that they're uncomfortable. They've been making us uncomfortable forever. So we got to make sure that they uncomfortable when they walk through these streets talking about, you know, Black Lives Matter, right? Well, while they, you know, uh, continuously, you know, and deliberately um, shun Mumia from freedom, right? Um, to hear my grandpa, you know, is undergoing surgery, you know, like I'm, I'm just like really, you know, like anxious, right? Um, Mumia Abu Jamal is an educator, a journalist, a scholar. He's not a criminal. He's a man. We need to keep going hard. Make sure my grandfather is treated like a human being. No shackles when he's undergoing so surgery. Uh, the ability to contact his counsel, spiritual and personal. Um, the ability to contact his loved ones. Right. You know, even though his blood runs through my veins, I know his words, his voice runs through y'all. You know, we all family. This is my pop's pop, my folks. He's the voice of all of us, right? All of the people. You know, he doesn't compromise, he speaks the truth. And that's why we have to do everything. We have to do everything we have to do to get him out. We're shoulder to shoulder fighting for his life of a black revolutionary who still smiles, who still laughs, who still loves, who still empower, who's still empowered and inspires us all. Um, freedom is the only treatment at this point, especially after 40 years, you know, he's getting aged, he's getting old. Freedom is the only treatment. Freedom is the only justice that the people will accept. People all over the world have been developing solidarity actions for Amumia over the last several decades. And and they remain incredulous that he has had to spend the last 40 years of his life under conditions that no human being should have to uh, live. When I first spoke with Mumia on the phone, I did very little talking. I just listened. Hearing him speak was a reminder of why we must continue to fight. Earlier this year, the United Nations Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner issued a statement noting that prolonged solitary confinement, the precise type often used in the United States, amounts to psychological torture. Mumia Abu Jamal has spent roughly 30 out of his 38 years in solitary confinement. In his book, Live from Death Row, Mumia wrote that prison is a second by second assault on the soul, a day to day degradation of the self an oppressive steel and brick umbrella that transforms seconds into hours and hours into days. He has had to endure this second by second assault on his soul for 38 years. We knew at the beginning of this pandemic that prisons were going to be responsible for the rapid spread of COVID-19. And we called for the release of prisoners, especially aging prisoners. And we know that imprisonment speeds up the aging process. This is one of so many reasons why we need to abolish prisons. Nelson Mandela taught us that you can tell the character of a country by how it treats its prisoners, by the conditions of its prisons. Thousands of prisoners in the United States have died from COVID-19 since this pandemic began. Thousands of prisoners have died. This is not the result of an accident. This is not the result of negligence. This is a criminal policy to keep men and women behind bars while a deadly pandemic rips through these concentration camps, concentration camps for poor and oppressed people. Bruce Norris is a man who the parole board granted exit from prison. While he was waiting for Governor Wolf to sign those commutation papers, he died of COVID in his cell. This is not a mistake. This is a policy to keep them behind bars dying of this deadly pandemic in condition. 
conditions where it is impossible to social distance, where they are not the ones bringing this virus into the facilities. It's the staff. It's the guards. That's the only way that the, the virus is getting in. Today, we are living through a moment where it's acceptable to paint end racism now in front of the Philadelphia Police Department's 26th District Headquarters. And yet a political prisoner who has since the age of 14 dedicated his life to fighting against racism continues to be caged and lives his life on a slow death row. We're in the midst of a movement that says Black Lives Matter. And if that's truly the case, then it means that Mumia's life and legacy must matter. And the causes that he sacrifices life and freedom for must matter as well. It is time to release this man. He is innocent. He is innocent. He is innocent. And when we fight for Momia, we fight for every single person caught up in this racist, white supremacist prison system. Momia is the voice of the voiceless, and we will not let Larry Krasner, Governor Wolf, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman and John Wetzel snuff that voice out. We've got to make it clear. This is the moment. To everybody who is responsible, politicians, governors, prosecutors, Democratic Party, what have you, that if Mumia dies in prison, if you allow him to die in a dungeon, then this will be an unforgivable insult to the Black Freedom Movement. You better pray to God, motherfucker. You better pray to God that nothing happens to me. You are up there, you the motherfucking Judas. You the motherfucking Judas to humanity. You the motherfucking Judas to justice. Judas and the Black Messiah. Krasner and the Black Messiah. You know that motherfucking shit was so heavy on the traitor's mind that he turned around and committed suicide. You can live with what you're doing. And you who were complicit in this, you will share this blame, this responsibility, and its consequences, and you will take them to your grave. And we want y'all to know that they are using Momia as an example. They are using him as an intimidation tactic to show people this is what you get if you dare to stand up against us. You can't let them do that. You can't because being silent is not being safe. So what can we do? Um, I think it's a time to take direct action in the streets on April 24th, the day of Mumia's birthday. I believe that if we understand this and if we reach out to others, we must get to understand this, that Mumia will walk out of that prison or if necessary, be rolled out in a wheelchair, free, and not die behind bars. That's our revolutionary mission. At the moment, I can't think of anything more important.